first reading is from the book of Jonah in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and verse 10. And um, I'll make mention of it in the sermon. The book of, of Jonah is uh, really uh, a satirical book. Um, Assyria, Nineveh, uh, the capital of Assyria, uh, was a great enemy of particularly the northern kingdom, Israel. They, they destroyed the northern kingdom, and that was the end of the ten tribes. Those, those people became the Samaritans, right? It's only uh, basically the southern kingdom that, that survived. Um, so th this is a story. This is not a historical book. Uh, it's satire. It's high or low comedy. Um, uh, really probably addressed to uh, the Jewish people that came back after exile, um, trying to challenge them not to be totally inward focused. So I'll say more uh, about this. Uh, but again, this is such an exaggerated story. You know, I, I heard years ago when there still was sort of like a Cold War on, uh, someone suggested to get the feel of this. Uh, imagine Billy Graham going to Moscow at the height of the Cold War and the Kremlin saying, we believe, you know, uh, and we're now at peace, right? It, that that kind of gives you the flavor of this book. So with that as a, a hopefully helpful introduction, let us listen for God's word. The word of the Lord came to Joan, uh, Jonah a second time saying, get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And the gospel reading is Mark's gospel, chapter 1, uh, verses 14 through 20. Let us listen for God's word. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So um, uh, the, the profound challenge of reading the Bible and then trying to make sense of it, which is my uh, life-given task, is that our experience of life is so uh, limited and our perspective is so human and small. And in the Bible, we're trying to be brought into the, the perspective and the consciousness of God, at least as much as frail human beings like you and I can, can do. 
So right away, it's this task of calling us to uh, move into a level of consciousness and being which is beyond where we are each and every moment. So it's always discomforting. It's, it's always taking us uh, beyond what we're, where we're capable of going uh, on our own. And Jesus for us is the one who bridges this unbridgeable gap between heaven and earth or uh, uh, infinity and, and the finite, uh, the human and the divine. And he embodies a way for us which is more whole, which is more real, which is more true and beautiful than we can even begin to grasp. But, but we, we, we see it, a, enough of it, that it, it tugs on something in us that can recognize the beauty and truth of it and says, that's our true home. That's our true goal. And by definition, it takes us, the only way we can move into it is if we move into a path of personal transformation. And I think the church has done a, a really exceedingly poor job of communicating this. What we've, what we've said is, uh, well, you know, God can't possibly ask more of us than, than we can bring to the table. So uh, therefore, what we do is we, we fit the incredible vision uh, and good news into a container that somehow we feel comfortable with. And so we end up forever distorting what it is that Jesus is about. Uh, the, the real message is this is way beyond us. And the only way, whenever we sign up, something in us says yes to the call, just as these, just, I'm always amazed at these, uh, these stories of call, you know, Jesus shows up and immediately you know, John and James left uh, the old man on the boat <laughs> with the hired hands immediately, right? They didn't look behind. Something in us says yes. Frail and a hedging uh, of our bets as we are, something in us recognizes the truth. We say yes to it and we give our lives to it. But of course, what we find is that there's always this gravitational pull trying to bring bring it back to a place that is manageable and non-threatening to who we are. And when we say yes to following Christ, what we're really saying yes to is this continual, never-ending path of personal transformation, of dying daily to who we are, so that uh, the more and more of Christ can take root inside of ourselves. It's, it's just this... It, as Soren Kierkegaard called it, is he called it the uh, a possible impossibility of Christian discipleship. It's, it, it's impossible, but somehow through faith is possible. And we need to feel that. We need to feel, uh, you know, the impossibility of it before we really can embrace it. And so, I, you know, I was thinking about that um, uh, this week, and uh, I am not talking politics this week. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I did that the past two Sundays. Um, but still, we're living in this context, right, of, of incredible un unsettling. I mean, um, I, I just feel like we're in a wormhole uh, of transition as a, as a species, as a planet. And um, I, I don't know about you, but I have felt in way over my head. <laughs> I am... I am way over my pay grade uh, of, of really being able to hold this and to make sense of this, much less communicate uh, a word of hope uh, to, to myself, <laughs> much less you all. And, and, and what I'm feeling is that there's, I, I know God is in this. I know it. Something in me knows it, but I can't quite yet see it. I can't quite yet contain it. I can't quite yet live into it. And so I, I can't quite yet really experience the hope and the good news with real clarity and conviction. Because even though I feel it, I, I'm not there yet enough to really truly be able to hold this profound moment. And it's a profound moment. And yet I think being open to that 
is really a, a necessary state, uh, state for me and for all of us if we're really going to move with the Spirit into the transformation that I believe the Spirit is about in and amongst us. So I'm just in this space, right, dealing with the Scripture, dealing with the moment, and uh, a poem by uh, William Butler Yeats came to mind, uh, The Second Coming. Perhaps you've read this. I read it for the first time in college, and it, it felt like a revelation to me, like it was communicating something so incredibly true and powerful that I needed to pay attention to. And, and I not only felt that way then when I was 19 years old, but I feel, I feel even more so today when I look at this poem. Uh, Yeats wrote it in 1919 as the First World War had come to an end. So, you know, think about the tumult and the chaos and the disillusionment of that moment in time. In fact, so many people say that the First World War was when uh, the post-Enlightenment, uh, the modern uh, optimism uh, began to, to crumble and come to an end. Because people felt like, you know, with the power of human reason, with, you know, the power of democratic representation, uh, the, you know, the kingdom of heaven was at our fingertips. In fact, there was, a, there was a Christian publication called The Christian Century, and it was called The Christian Century because they believed by the end of the 20th century, the kingdom will have arrived. Well, uh, uh, they proved not to be uh, good prophets, right? And the First World War was what really began to take the steam out of, of Western human optimism. You know, it, it just was like, we didn't see the shadow. We didn't see how evil was right at, always at the door, no matter how smart, technologically brilliant we had become. That technological brilliance could be unleashed in horrifying ways. Hard to imagine the horror of that. And then, 20 years later, the world signed up for a second world war as if we didn't have enough the first time around, right? So why does that happen, right? Why does evil and darkness keep showing up despite our good intentions? And, and you know, we can, we can excuse the second world war uh, because we had a madman show up on the globe. But what set up the conditions for a demagogue, for an authoritarian, uh, you know, charismatic leader to come and say, I have the answers, right? It's all of the decisions made out of human blindness and cluelessness that create an atmosphere that sets us up for the darkness to return. And it's with that clarity of insight, really prophetic brilliance, that Yeats wrote this uh, poem, and I'm going to share it with you. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity surely some revelation is at hand Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs 
while all about it reel shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So this is a dark poem filled with foreboding of, in the image of a sphinx, this monstrous, pitiless beast after 20 centuries of, you know, Christian striving for the kingdom is slouching forth to Bethlehem to be born. Not the second coming of Christ, the age of peace, but this pitiless, dark, animalistic energy being loosed upon our planet. And, you know, uh, we Americans, we're congenitally optimists, right? <laughs> Always look on the bright side as Roseanne and I were watching The Life of Brian the other night and you've never seen it. Uh, it, it it's, it's good to see some good comedy every once in a while. And so uh, Brian and some others are, are on, on the cross hanging and someone tells, he tries to encourage him to look at the bright side <laughs> of crucifixion. That's kind of uh, American gallows humor, right? We're, we, you know, we just, you know, think positive. But what Yates knew is that until we see the darkness, we won't find the ability within us to move against it to the light. If we think our darkness is light, right? We'll continue down the road we're at pretending like, oh, everything's fine. When darkness lies always at the door waiting for a little crack from which to enter. So I don't know where you're at. Uh, I can see the darkness. You know, that, that's one of my gifts. I can see the darkness. It's, it's the light sometimes that I have trouble seeing. And it's with that sort of uh, place of being that I, you know, started to, to look at the text this morning and to read the words. And these words of Jesus jumped off the page when he, this is his first public pronouncement, his first sermon. And he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So in our context, what do we do with these words? How do we live into these words? Has the time, in fact, been fulfilled? Has the kingdom of God, in fact, come near to us? Can, can you, can, can I really believe in our heart of hearts the good news that is here? And I think it hinges all on one word, and that word is repent. Metanoia in Greek, repent, metanoia, which means get a new mind. Get a new mind, let go of your mind. Get a new one, get a higher mind. And if we were to talk in, uh, uh, you know, parlance of uh, the brain, it would mean we know that reptilian brain is still there and it's going to be firing every day. Learn to tame it. Learn to activate this prefrontal cortex from which compassion and creativity and hope can be born. Get a new mind, get a higher mind. In essence, if you get a new mind, are you not a new self, right? 
become a new person really is what Jesus is saying. And the only thing that is standing between us and a new humanity is our clinging to who we think we are. Our refusal to let go, our refusal to repent and to allow God to do in us what we can on our own. And, and it's that which enables me to think that I might be able to praise this moment in time. And it's, it's that which enables me to even accept my own inability to measure up to the moment. It, it's that which enables me to be okay with the fact that I am feeling overwhelmed. Because the good news that Jesus promises is that we can die to the limitations of who we are right now and become more than we ever dreamed we could be through the strength and the grace of God at work with us. God is able, out of the rubble of ourselves, to bring about a new creation, a new humanity. And so the rubble of myself that I feel and am discouraged by is actually the precondition for the new creation in me, through me. But what I really realize this week is that I can only receive this hope through faith. My mind will not get me to hope. My mind simply cannot see beyond the limits of myself or the limits of the past. And the reason it's so hard for me, and I think I'm not alone in this, all of us, to envision a really truly genuinely new future is because uh, we, we believe that the only thing is possible is what has been before. We don't really believe that genuine change is possible in ourselves or in others. And so we remain in prison to what has been before. So our mind, I'm suggesting, at least for me, cannot get me to the promised land I want to enter. Um, only faith can do that. And that's where the Jonah text kind of made sense to me, that, that uh, to our minds, the good news, right, uh, seems farcical, right? It just, it seems like a, a, a pipe dream. Uh, and I would suggest that this is exactly what the book of Jonah is saying to us. The book of Jonah is religious comedy, as I said. There was no Jewish prophet who entered Nineveh and converted it. It did not happen. Assyria destroyed Israel. There was no coming together of Israel and uh, Assyria and all the people sing, saying Kumbaya. That, that did not happen. It, it, any more than I expect for the Republicans, it, this is the only political remark, the Republicans and Democrats in Congress to come together in the weeks ahead and all of a sudden they're going to be holding hands and singing Kumbaya. Uh, I, I'll give you, I'll take that bet. <laughs> if anybody wants to make that bet with me, I'll take that bet. It's not going to happen. Don't 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 wait for it to happen. Right wing uh, news media and so-called mainstream media are not going to have a joint broadcast anytime soon where all the anchors will sing together. Why can't we be friends? It's not going to happen. That's not what Jesus meant by good news. Right. And our minds can see the absurdity of even thinking about that. We simply will not be able to think our way uh, to the new humanity without profound and authentic repentance. In other words, a letting go of our attachment to who we are now and allowing, trusting God to do a new thing in us that we cannot do. All we can do is try to... Uh, 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 you know, to, to go along with it. So I don't hope in some other or others uh, uh, to deliver a new humanity to us as if it is a gift that can be packaged that we can open and receive. I, I don't expect God um, to uh, give us a, a, a trust fund uh, that we can inherit, a, a new humanity trust fund, right? where each month we get a, a, an infusion of 
new humanity uh, energy that, that all we have to do is, you know, go to the mailbox and, and receive. The only way for a new humanity to come is if we become it. You and me. The only way is if we become the new humanity. And the only possibility of a new humanity that I have any power to have influence on is me, right? Not you. I can't, I can't engender the new humanity in you. I can, I can barely even cooperate with it happening in me. And so the only relevant question for us this morning is, am I willing to practice yielding myself to God? in hope and in trust that God may do in me what I can't do. That's the only question. All other questions, all other schemes and plans and prophecies really in the end are just diversions from our one true work, which is death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. And, you know, in a consumerist culture like, like our, I'm not, I'm not sure that you know, uh, a lot of people are going to jump on that Christ path, right? And I, I don't even trust myself to take the path that I say I believe in because I'm just too weak and human. But this I believe in. God's ability to take even our halting and provisional yeses and uh, with the seed of that yes in us, to move us towards true repentance. And that's why I hope. So uh, Amanda Gorman uh, blew me away uh, on January 20th. Uh, I found myself just really overwhelmed as her words of honesty and hope cascaded upon my soul. In fact, I found myself, I may have even held my arms up, uh, shielding myself from the power of those words. And um, because I was sitting next to Roseanne, I didn't want to be sobbing, stifling the sobs that wanted to arise within me. Somehow this 22 year old was able to see both of our, both our refusal to repent <laughs> and the inevitability of our repentance at the same time, if that makes sense. She's, she was able to really internalize, to, to feel our hopelessness and our lostness and the hope and the promise of the moment at the same time. And because she could see it, I mean, she, she, was, she could see it. She internalized it and that's why her words hit with such force because she tapped into what God sees because God sees both things at the same time, our resistance and our desire to yield at the same time. Our minds can't see beyond who we are, but the mind of God that dwells within us can. And that mind is accessed through faith, through trust. And our work is to over and over and over again, let go of who we are into that in us, which knows that we are held. Young Amanda Gorman ended her prophecy with these words. The new dawn blooms as we free it. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. 
And I think that is a brilliant summary of the gospel, of the good news, of the kingdom which is drawn near, of the time that has been fulfilled. It's all ready to be born when we become brave enough to see it and brave enough to become it. May it be so. Amen.